Hello and welcome to a new strip, Hal Naked. I'm Hass, and along with my guest this time, I'm going to show you some of the cool stuff lurking in the pages of some of the best comics. In this special Creators Edition series, I'm joined by a guest as we discuss some pages and sequences from their work, and learn a little about their storytelling process. We're back with another episode of the series with Andre Araujo. In this final episode, we're going to talk about Black Panther, Long Live the King, and Andre's decisions in action scenes. So let's get into it. Okay, Andrew, so the first thing that immediately jumped out at me in these action sequences is the amount of background information you put into them. Firstly, it speaks to what I'm assuming is the huge amount of time it takes to draw these pages, but really they're quite specifically drawn in every single panel, except one in this whole sequence across three pages. Why is the background so important in a scene like this, where so often what we see in superhero comics is moments like this drawn without them? Background, for example, here is important because this is a uh, Chala, uh, running in the city, you know, in the middle of the city, and this is, the, the ground is collapsing and uh, people are about to die. And um, so it is important for me to show you the background all the time here. And in, in specifically in that middle panel that you mentioned, there is a woman in the center of the panel that she is in the previous scenes. So she is an important point of continuity. And the, the entire setting, I think, feels needed here most of the time. And that's why it's there. It's always there. It takes an enormous amount of time, yes, you were right, because there is always a bunch of characters and things falling. And then uh, whenever I finish drawing those, I go and I put all the speed lines on top of it. Mm -hmm. It takes an enormous amount of time. And when I do speed lines, for example, on that middle panel that you are speaking, Chala is on front of the speed lines. So I have to, you know, draw them with care. <laughs> interrupt them when his body is in because I draw everything and only then <laughs> it should be much easier digitally but I, I just prefer to, I just prefer to pencil it okay so your concern here is really about sort of like placement and grounding the sequence in the world around them to reinforce the destruction and that's the concern and really the only panel where there is no background really it's the third panel on the third page which is the moment where he saves one of the the ladies that are falling down this this hole in the ground. And it's just this moment of uh, being able to reach one person and then on the next panel you see that he failed to reach both of them. And that's it. that's why I wanted to isolate that moment and on colors, here Chris did a great job because you have a dark background on all the scenes except for that one, which is a, a yellow background which makes the, the both hands grabbing really pop and it, it's a singular moment on this sequence. So the other big thing that felt different with these pages compared to ones we've looked at in previous episodes with you was the use of the bleed panels. They're rarely used in your other stuff, going through pages and pages of your work. They only come up in very, very, very rare moments. But here there are a couple of examples of them in this sequence. So is this just about sort of breaking a moment out of the norm, making it feel a bit different? Yeah, that, that's precisely it. I just, I keep it just for when I think that you, and I need a moment to stand out, for example and to give a sense of um, the action being larger than the page itself, something like that. Or when, when you need to, to to let people know that something is happening and it's continuing directly into the other page. I think you have another one here that shows that as well. Right. Uh, like a small panel, for example, that bleeds into the bottom of the page, like turn the page because something is about to happen. And or in this case, a specific case, it's about the action and it's about scale, so I want it to be as much as big as possible. And I want you to not be distracted with white gutters or something like that. Just let that image own the page. And I usually keep it to one image per page to keep it as clear as possible and to have that hook that we were speaking about before. And talking about making it big and dynamic, you have these slanted panel lines, but actually your action is pretty solid and defined inside those. I was thinking about contrasting your action scenes with an artist who maybe someone that does panel overlays or like, you know, like characters bursting out of panels, that sort of thing. You like to keep things incredibly structured even in these action sequences. For me, the page should be as easy to read as possible. So how do you move from panel to panel? That needs to be perfectly clear. And then inside of it, you can get as crazy as you want. But even there, I like to keep things pretty clear about the action that is going on, you know? This is the basic thing, that the story can be pretty abstract, but the action that is happening, for me, personally, I'm not saying that's the only way or the best way, right. but for me, personally, I want my stories to be as clear as possible in terms of action. What's going on? Where is this character going? What is he doing, basically? I don't want a, a complex layout to make that harder than it has to be. The, the only thing that I want you to take out of the layout is what 
panel is more important than other. And that's the size of it, you know. Or if you are on a page, for example, like I was speaking about, there's a fight on one of the Black Panther issues. You get to it, and it's uh, just a collection of panels, and you don't have a clear direction because I didn't want to. I don't. I want you to see that as being a, a rough uh, visual fight. So you get that from the layout right away. Is that you go from like 60 pages where everything is flowing nicely, and then you suddenly get to a page where you don't really know where to go, and that's what you're supposed to to understand. Make it as easy as possible to read. I'd like to ask you about what we'd call sort of sight lines or action lines usually on Strip Pal Naked. You have a very clear sort of left to right action lines, and there's a sense of the panel here of this kind of like sweeping arc from left to right of these people falling. How much of that is like designed and how much of that is just sort of instinct? That's intentional as well. Again, when I do do something like that, I don't, th I didn't draw a line and then you know, draw over that line to guide mm -hmm. the eye through the page. It's basically a, an instinct that goes on, but, um, I do draw sometimes, I intentionally only think of that when I'm having trouble doing the layout of the scene, you know? Right. Like uh, if, if I'm having trouble setting a scene, because sometimes you need to show things that are conflicting with each other, I will have to go more mechanically to try to break it down. But on this case, I don't. Uh, th that was not the, the, the situation here. I'm not concerned with guiding the eye through the panel in the correct way, because you know pretty clearly where you have to go. And the action sequence itself, for me, it's more important to show what's happening inside every panel and to understand the um, sequence from one panel to another, for me, is more important than to actually have the composition of the panel guiding you from left to right and top to bottom. Right. I do that sometimes, but yeah. it's not my primary concern. It's actually reminding me, because we talked in the first Creators Edition episode with you, when we talked about Man Plus and the opening of that, where you talked about how, for you, a lot of it is depth through the, the foreground, the middle, and the background, which you can really see clearly in this panel. There's a really kind of sense of depth being created by those different elements. That, exactly. That's more the concern. I try to guide, if a character is, is running, for example, and jumping and stuff like that, I try to put it from left to right, you know. Mm -hmm. It's easier to read like that, and it's easier to, for you to grasp, like the, the the first page of this sequence that, that you're talking about. Chala is running always from left to right and jumping from left to right because that's the way we read. I try to keep characters on the same side, which is, you know, a basic rule of TV and movies and even on comics. Particularly on dialogue, for example, if you have a character standing on the left and then a character on the right, you keep that throughout the page, to not make a lot of confusion. And it's always about what's easier to read in terms of story. Uh, so ultimately, all of this, you're, you're working towards clarity as a primary concern over essentially everything else. I go with instinct first, always, because I want for it to be like that yeah. for the reader as well. I don't want it to, um, to make an effort to understand what's going on. It's yeah. pretty clear what I'm doing with this page, I think. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. exactly it. I, I, I want it to be just immediate and uh, more visual. It's just like, it's what is natural for us to to understand by the, the visual cues that I'm giving you. Well, that's key, I think, when it comes to Andre's work, clarity in storytelling, which is probably the perfect goal in many cases to aim for. Andre's approach is instinctual, but as we heard in the first episode, it's based off of research and reading across various forms of comics. I think this has really been an insightful look at his work, so thank you, Andre, for taking the time to do this, and his approach and methodology across a few different comics in Man Plus, Generation Gone, and Black Panther. So I really, really hope you've enjoyed it too. If there's anyone else you'd be interested in hearing from in a future Creators Edition series, let me know in the comments, and you're going to be able to get access to the majority of this whole interview that I did with Andre. It's quite a long one, about an hour or so in length, on the Strip Pile Naked Patreon really, really soon. So if you want to support the channel in any way, jump onto the Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Naked. If you do that, you're going to get access to literally years and years worth of exclusive writing, annotations and reading lists that we've been doing for episodes since sort of September or August in 2016, so it's quite a long time. So if you want to support the channel, that's how you can do that. If you want to check out the magazine that I edit, it's called Panel by Panel. You can find that at panelxpanel.com. We've got years of that as well for you to dive into. We were into our fourth year making the magazine. We won an Eisner last year. If you like the kind of stuff that we talk about in Strip Panel Naked, you will absolutely adore Panel by Panel. So if you are interested in that, you can find that at panelxpanel.com. If you've never seen that before, then check it out. You're going to love it. Otherwise, thank you for watching, and we'll be back very, very soon with a regular episode of the series.